Okay, um, good evening and um, welcome everyone to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and we're delighted to have with us this evening, journalist Florence Williams, here to talk about her new book, Heartbreak, a personal and scientific journey. A couple of brief housekeeping notes. First though, to post a question at uh, any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Heartbreak. Florence is a, is a journalist, author, and podcaster whose work has focused on the environment, health, and science. She's a contributing editor at Outside Magazine and has done freelance work for a number of uh, other publications. She's also written a couple of previous books, Breasts, A Social, Cultural, Medical, and Scientific History of the Human Breast, and The Nature Fix, about nature as a source of physical and mental reinvigoration. At age 50, Florence uh, found herself traumatized by a divorce from the man she had been with since she was 18 and married to for 25 years. When she started looking into the subject of heartbreak, she found little research had been done, even though it ranks as one of the most stressful and consequential life experiences. So she set out to write about, uh, write a book about it, drawing not only on interviews with psychologists, geneticists, and other experts on emotion and behavior, but also on experiments she conducted herself to better understand how heartbreak affects our nerves, bodies, and sense of ourselves. What she discovered, she writes, was extraordinary, surprising, and immensely helpful. And reviewers have agreed. Kirkus called the book a provocative and rewarding read, and publishers weekly hailed it as an impressive and moving survey and a courageous whirlwind tale of healing and self-discovery. In conversation with Florence this evening will be Jackie Lydon, who worked as a correspondent and host for NPR for more than three decades. She's also the author of the memoir, Daughter of the Queen of Sheba, uh, Growing Up with a Mentally Ill Mother. And she's writing a new memoir titled, Tell Me Something Good, which um, I'm told uh, uh, describes her transformation from uh, NPR journalist to a writer. So Florence and Jackie, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Well, this is absolutely delicious, and it's, it's great to see you, Florence. I can almost see your heart. We have our, we have on our matching hearts, friends. And listen, we want to welcome this book into the world, but we also want to welcome you into this conversation, because let's face it, who among us hasn't had their hearts ripped to confetti, shoved through the organ grinder, stomped on, spavined? Florence, you fell into the abyss and you crawled out of it. Bravo for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't, you know, it didn't begin with bells going off and uh, star shooting. Uh, you know, the book is endearing because you reveal your heart and then you also take us to the molecular level. So we do have to begin at the beginning, leaving this long marriage, which Brad just described for us, 25 years, two children, it, it simply was not your idea and it came as a bolt out of the blue. Yes, um, and first I, I just wanna thank Politics and Prose for having us. I wanna thank people in the audience for showing up. Uh, I wanna thank you, Jackie, because you dropped off these wonderful little props <laughs> on my porch today. So <laughs> <laughs> and they're whole they're not even ripped up so well, if we had been able to be in person everyone was going to get sweet tarts with your name on them so yes this is and I, I wish I had chocolate to hand out but <laughs> um yeah so I, I cannot procrastinate this question anymore yes I mean I I, I have to establish that I was in fact heartbroken um I had been married for 25 years met the man who would be my husband when I was 18 uh, was not my idea, um, to split up. And in fact, he told me at one point that he wanted to go find his soulmate and that I was not that person. So it, it was a shock. It was devastating. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was, and I had never been heartbroken before. 
So, you know, I had met him when I was 18 and, and had, had been spared, I think, you know, some of those, um, you know, dramas of life that, that most of us go through earlier. Um, and what I noticed, you know, among, among the deep emotional pains, was this incredible physical reaction that I had. And I felt like there was so much art about heartbreak, but you know, where was the science? I wanted to understand what was happening to me if I was gonna figure out how to feel better. You know, I was uh, finding you pretty admirable almost from the get-go. Um, this announcement from your ex, you actually made a bombshell discovery one night and had to keep cooking dinner for a dinner party, kind of the worst imaginable situation, I would think, or maybe not, I don't know. Okay, yes, yeah, so are we gonna go there? Yes, okay, so so Two. one night I was cooking dinner, <laughs> cooking dinner for friends, we were about to walk in the door and um, my husband handed me his phone to see an email from his brother, but there was an email um, expressing his love uh, for someone else. And so, um, that was really the moment of shock. For me, that's the moment when it began. I think for him, his story might might start somewhere else, but but that's when that's when it started for me. Well, I wanted to establish that um, it really was a break. We really do feel this cataclysmic sense of fright or flight, and and almost immediately. And this is what I meant about being so admirable. You start to think about your physical state. More than I think someone who wasn't a science writer who, you know, you've written as you have uh, with yourself as a subject before, you think about your sleeplessness, you think about your, um, the fact that you said you felt like you were plugged into a wall, lost in a wood, uh, that all the cliches of heartbreak came true. Yeah, you know, when my friends had gone through heartbreak, I always thought it seemed so melodramatic. <laughs> I'm not sure I was very sympathetic. I just thought, well, you know, obviously the guy's a loser, you know, move on. What's the big, you know, get over it. Um, but when it happened to me, you know, all of those sort of cliches of heartbreak, you feel, you know, like you've been axed in the heart or you're set adrift in an ocean. Um, they all seemed suddenly incredibly, you know, pertinent and accurate. <laughs> Uh, I, I had always thought that heartbreak was something that happens in your head, something in your psyche. Um, and so when my body started to sort of break down, it surprised me. It baffled me. Um, it freaked me out. I mean, there were among, among many other things that freaked me out about, about this experience. You lost almost 20 pounds, which you did not have to lose. You veered very much to the edge of diabetes. Uh, you write that Romantic heartbreak can cause complex emotional trauma that we humans feel rejection as a deeply evolved threat to our survival. So your research begins to look for these bodily, biological markers. And I thought threat to our survival. I would not have thought that, that we are so hardwired to pair a bond until I read this, this book, actually. Yeah, I, one of the first people I ran into just really weeks after the split was biological anthropologist Helen Fisher. And she is very well known for writing about the sort of neurotransmitters of love, you know, the wonderful feelings we get when we fall in love, the dopamine and the serotonin. Um, but she's also one of the few people who's looked at what happens on the other side of love. Uh, one of the experiments that she did was she um, put people who have been rejected in love in a brain scanner and showed them pictures, their rejecting beloveds, uh, and scanned their brains. And she found um, sort of two interesting findings. Um, one was that a part of our brain gets activated that's associated um, with addiction and craving. Because just because you've lost someone you've loved doesn't mean you necessarily stop loving them right away when you think perhaps it would be smart to do that. Your brain notices they're gone. I mean, this, this attachment part, this primary attachment partner, um, you know, has been next to you physically for decades and your bodies co-regulate. So your heart beats line up, your respiration lines up, your cortisol levels align. Uh, and when that person takes off, um, your body registers that and processes it um, as a peril, you know, it's like this, this security, this safety is now missing. Um, it's almost as if you've been left 
out to wander the savanna, you know, by yourself well, with hyenas nearby. Your, your body doesn't <laughs> make a distinction between yeah. being sort of abandoned in the jungle and, um, you know, being rejected in love. Not just vulnerability, it's, it's edgy vulnerability. And I love uh, Helen Fisher as a character. She is so jazzy and she's not just any, uh, I think, what is she? She's a, uh, she's a senior research fellow at the Kinsey Institute. She's a consultant to Match.com. You call her the goddess of love. Um, <laughs> she also talks about what does is, what is she encourage you to do? The two of you are sort of dancing well, to the sprinkler. You know, as much as she's willing to talk about heartbreak, you know, what really you know, lights her fire is love <laughs> and falling in love. That's what she's really written about so, so well and so much. Um, she says that she's 20 years older than I am. And I found her so warm and maternal. And she was like, kiddo, come on over. I you sit on my couch. I'm going to make you some tea and I'm going to tell you what's happening to your brain. Uh, and it was, for me, it was just validating and comforting. Um, and she was herself newly in love at 70 uh, and, and she was glowing and beaming. And she said, what you really need to do is, you know, you need to fall in love again. You need to find another man. You're going to be so glad you know, that your marriage is over. You know, I wasn't ready to hear any of that. Um, but she was charming and, and she did become a fun character in the book. But she didn't want you to get dumped again too quickly. She wanted yeah. you because she did understand that there were some serious biological downsides. Utah turned out to be a really productive place for you. I know you've studied with, with Terry Tempest Williams and uh, it, you, you meet a number of people who are researchers at the University of Utah, including next one up, uh, is it Bert Uchino? Yeah. Uh, who is not nearly quite the buoying spirit that Helen Fisher is. I mean, he, he basically says that uh, divorce is just one of the worst things that can happen to a person after death. Yeah, um, Bert Uchino really specializes in studying social support. So the tremendous benefits that we humans get from being in a good, strong, romantic relationship. Uh, he pointed out to me, you know, all the fantastic health benefits of being married. And I was like, stop, you know. Uh, and then he said, yeah, you know, people who are divorced, sorry, but people who are divorced fare worse than anyone. They fare worse than people who have never been married. They fare worse than people who are married. They fare worse than people who are widowed or widowers because, um, and, and you know, obviously this is on a kind of generalized population level, um, but they've experienced rejection and the psychology of rejection, you know, can be um, really intense. They've experienced the stresses of the divorce itself and, and the stresses of conflict. And before that, they probably experienced the stresses of a not great marriage to begin with. So while being in a bad marriage is, is also bad for your health, um, being divorced can be worse unless the bad marriage is, you know, really like immediately sort of threatening to your safety. At what point did you decide to turn some of these observations? Did you decide to really go for this? To, like to sort of make a case study that would become the narrative for a book project? You know, I don't know. I mean, as a science journalist, I just felt like it was my instinct to want to understand what was happening, to talk to experts, to ask questions. At first, I thought maybe there would be some kind of audio project that would come out of this. I was working on some podcasts at the time. So I just started taping everyone I talked to. Um, I wasn't really sure there was a book there, probably until I met an, another scientist named Stephen Cole. But I think even before that, there's Right after I talked to Bert Uchino, I'd love to talk about the scientist I talked to right after that, because she was the one who really set the trajectory oh, for the next yeah. couple of years of my life. Um, well, you and the goddess came. of love, and then comes the goddess of awe. Right. So there was the goddess of love. Then there was like the bummer dude who told me about, you know, how messed up I was going to be for the rest of my life and how I was going to die early. <laughs> because Almost divorced period. people die 23%. They have a 23% increased risk of dying early. So, so then I went across the hall, thank goodness. <laughs> and I talked to his colleague, Paula Williams, who um, said to me, yes, you know, yes, you'll die younger, blah, 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 blah. It's awful. But there are some people who are really resilient and who come through this event and come through other life tragedies, um, you know, pretty easily. And we have found in our lab, you know, some of the personality traits and qualities of these people. 
And that's when I just leaned forward, you know, and I was like, tell me, tell me everything, you know, like, <laughs> how do I become one of those resilient people? How can I feel better? And how can I get my body to feel better? Um, and she said that we, we think the secret sauce to this um, are the people who are able to cultivate beauty, who can find beauty, who can um, really appreciate art or appreciate nature, who are able to easily access a state of awe. And she, she told me all about the science of awe and how the brains of people experiencing awe are able to sort of make more connections, how these people are able to still experience joy, how they're able to um, easily create narratives and make sense and make meaning from their experiences. And I thought, well, that's something I can try to do. I do like beauty. I like nature. I'm going to try to, I think, I think the, the phrase I said was I'm going to claw my way through art heartbreak by trying to awe my way through it. Um, and so I, I found it wildly hopeful that, that there was suddenly this sort of roadway that I had never heard before. I mean, you don't really hear of beauty as being an antidote to heartbreak. And I thought that's something I can try. Well, that's interesting because you, are the author of the nature fix so one might have thought that that would have come instantly but of course one's brain is literally so scattered after a loss like a heartbreak the sense of disassociation which you describe um you, you had a wonderful line in here you said in another place i was finding it disorienting and nonsensical nonsensical to go from feeling like i had a partner who would save my life on a mountaintop your husband was also a big outdoors man, to finding one who wanted to live his life without me. Lots packed in there. And I'm not sure that I would have thought of, I must experience awe as an antidote either. And she's not talking about religious awe. She's talking about, but what is she talking about? The So, so really the she's talking about, she's talking about a personality trait openness. called openness. So we, you know, and we tend to think of our personality traits as being fixed. So you're either an extrovert or you're an introvert, you're neurotic or you're not neurotic, you're conscientious or you're not conscientious. Um, these personality traits tend to stay very stable over time. But there's one personality trait called openness, which she thinks we can shift. We can move the needle on this. Um, it means being open to new experiences. Um, it means being curious. It means, um, um, seeking adventure, having a sense of adventure, um, finding joy. And specifically, as far as awe, it means sort of the ability to feel goosebumps, which she calls aesthetic chill. When, for example, you're listening to a symphony, um, perhaps when you walk into a cathedral, um, when you're witnessing the birth of a child. I mean, there are many times when we experience awe and it, it doesn't even have to be dramatic. Sometimes it's the sunset or the full moon or the Milky Way. Um, these are experiences that make us feel like we're part of something larger than ourselves, like our own egos are smaller, like our own problems are smaller. And so it, it makes sense that, you know, if we are ruminating and obsessed, you know, with our heartbreak, if we can feel connected to something else, we're going to feel less lonely and we're going to feel a sense of perspective. And hopefully also what I needed at this moment was to get out of fight or flight and to feel a sense of calm you know, that we also feel actually in the presence of great beauty. You know, um, I once had an early heartbreak. I wonder, you're going to probably get a lot of interviewers who throw out their own personal <laughs> anecdotes. So forgive me, I'll keep it short. And after the dumping, after I got dumped, um, I, had, I was a part-time publicist for a dance company. And we had an assignment to roll across this dance floor just one afternoon after the dances were done. And the act of like 20 people rolling across this floor was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So that's collective. <laughs> that's collective awe. Or sometimes uh, Emile Durkheim called this collective effervescence. Um, and you, you feel it sometimes in a crowd, you know, you feel it in an audience. Um, it, it can be incredibly moving because it does make you feel like you're part of something larger. It makes you feel more connected to other people as well. But you didn't forget about if that's that is both biological and I suppose metaphysical, meta anyway, the concept of awe. But you had quite a hardline scientist also at your disposal when you encountered Steve Cole. And I'm, I'm going to let you describe him. Um, he's, he's a fascinating guy. He has studied AIDS and cancer and you would not 
think that he would be a part of this book, but he's quite essential. Yes. Um, Dr. Cole is really uh, an interesting guy. He, in the nineties, he, well, he's an immunogeneticist. So he really specializes in sort of really going in on the transcription, transcription factors, the epigenetic factors um, that, that um, determine people's health outcomes. Um, and he, he started this work really by looking at um, gay men with HIV and we had, there was a lot, not only did he have their blood, but he also had a lot of uh, questionnaires that they had filled out about how much social support they had. And what he found was that the men who were still in the closet were still very anxious about their own social state um, and who didn't have a lot of social support. These were the men who had fewer T cells, um, who progressed to full-blown disease and who died earlier more quickly. And so um, then he started looking at healthy people who identified as lonely. And he found um, that there were differences in their blood because we, we've known for a while that people who identify as lonely, and it is a subjective kind of feeling. You can be in a marriage and feel lonely. You can be in a crowd and feel lonely. Um, you can be alone and not feel, and, and feel like you have a lot of support. But people who identified as lonely, um, people, they, the, the researchers knew that they were dying earlier um, they were um, um, facing higher risk of all kinds of chronic diseases. He wanted to know why. So he started looking specifically at their white blood cells, their monocytes. And he found that they were in fact um, um, expressing more genes for inflammation and at the same time expressing fewer genes um, for virus fighting, um, which his theory about this, I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and it's that if you've been, if you're, if you're feeling alone, like you've been sort of kicked out of your clan and you are stumbling through the jungle alone, it can be adaptive to put out more of this inflammation because maybe you're about to suffer from a flesh wound. You know, you're more likely to be attacked by predator. Um, and at the same time, you don't need the virus biting capability because viruses are spreading groups and presumably you're alone. So, so that, that's, you know, sort of an interesting theory about it. But when I told him about my heartbreak and my recent adult diabetes, uh, type one diabetes diagnosis, he said, why don't you come into the lab and we'll look at your blood and we'll see how heartbroken your blood looks. <laughs> and then we'll see if it changes over time. And that's kind of what I thought, okay, maybe there's a real story here. I don't think anyone's ever done this. You know, he'd never worked with a journalist like this before. Th these aren't tests that you can get in your doctor's office. Um, and I thought it was a really just interesting and fresh way of, of looking at social pain. Um, and for me, just personally, I, I wanted to know what my blood had to say. I would want to know what's singing in the blood. He also says to you that divorce, heartbreak is one of the landmines of human existence. Does, did, when you would hear things like that from these scientists, did it frighten you? Oh yeah. I said to him, what am I supposed to do? You know, and, and he, he just very soberly said, don't be heartbroken forever. Uh, you know, it's, it's when this immune response becomes chronic, that's mm -hmm. when we really face um, these statistics of, of earlier death <laughs> and disease. So the idea is to get better. And I, so I felt this intense urgency to get better and also to help other people, um, you know, learn about this and, 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 and learn to take heartbreak more seriously, certainly more seriously than I did, you know, when I was a friend you know, to people who are heartbroken. It's actually, this is, it, it's this really serious emotional catastrophe and your blood shows that catastrophe. Yes. Well, everyone will be consulting you now. First, they'll look at this book and now you will become the expert on, on heartbreak. But, you know, you had to, you also, it wasn't only falling out of this marriage. It was a, it was a marriage that went basically from your late adolescence, being an 18 year old, you could debate whether or not that's even a fully grown up person. I'm sure every 18 year old would think so. Um, <laughs> into age 50 with just one person. That is in some you know, places, I mean, that happens. It's also somewhat unusual. Um, how did you begin to navigate that? Because as a girlfriend, you probably would have told someone else, you'll get over it, find another guy. What were your, uh, what were your flirting skills like after 32 years <laughs> with the same person? Very rusty. <laughs> I was like, what's flirting? I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I had to relearn everything. I felt like I had to relearn how to move through the world. Um, you know, as a person who, who 
felt alone. Um, I mean, I, I had, I had great friends and I, I had great relatives and I had my kids around half the time, but I still felt sort of existentially alone and freaked out. Um, you know, there's just this, um, anxiety, this intense anxiety, um, that really sets in, uh, it's part of that, just feeling like you're in a threat, a threat state. So, um, I think you should be open to new relationships or to trying to flirting. Well, I didn't think I would be, I was really done with men. I thought, um, you were angry at them. I was angry at them. I hate, I really, <laughs> Yes, I was feeling the sort of collective rage of of women in my family who had been left by men um, and and women for many generations who find themselves usually in dire straits, sometimes financially, um, physically. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I was mad at men, <laughs> let's just say. But, you know, the body sort of wants what it wants and it has a mind of its own. And uh, I did find myself flirting, you know, with someone not too long after the split. And I, and I, I felt like, you know, body parts were waking up that had been asleep for a long time. And that was also surprising and, um, you know, interesting and strange and, um, kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, not to go to that too much, it's one of the funnier parts of your book. And I want to say one of the things that makes this such a great read is is you're a game companion. Not only do you scale mountains and uh, ingest hallucinogenics and have acupuncture with moss piled on top of you, you said it looked like lorex trees, you're also just a wonderful writer, but you meet these characters and, and you do meet a guy in Boulder who, um, I guess I could say he has a harem and we could just leave it at that. I don't know, <laughs> you know but, he, but he's your sort of, uh, it's not a maiden voyage since he's a fellow. He's your knave's voyage, you could say. He takes you on a voyage. Yeah, I, I, it, it probably that probably wasn't the most auspicious first relationship to have right out of the gate, but <laughs> it, it did make for some interesting copy and uh, um, a, a lot of, I think, introspection. <laughs> so, yeah, exploration for sure. You know, I... Um, and by the way, you told me the other day that you named some of these characters after cities in Montana, which I thought was, was pretty great. So that one's Ennis. Um, you know, I don't want to fully leave the outdoor world because one of the things, oddly enough, that sort of, you write about it at length here and that just fascinated me was I must be the last person on the planet to know that peri, uh, prairie voles are some of the most monogamous mammals around. Who knew? And, and then I found a, a friend, uh, Camille Guthrie, has written a poem about them in her new poetry collection, Diamonds, which is doing great. Uh, shameless plug. But prairie voles, you learned from them. I did, yeah. Um, neuroscientists and psychologists love studying prairie voles um, because they, they do have similar social structures to humans. Um, they, they pair bond and they have these immediate cousins, uh, meadow voles, who do not pair bond, who are actually very promiscuous. And so by studying the difference, you can kind of find out what are the chemicals um, and the structures in the brain that um, lead us to pair bonding. Uh, and so I spent some time at the University of Colorado in a lab there um, where a, a professor named Zoe Donaldson um, is studying actually what happens if you separate pair bonded prairie voles. So I call it sort of a heartbreak hotel she, she, she makes these arranged marriages and then and it's sort of sad. She, she takes one of them away and she wants to know how long does it take for the remaining prairie vole to sort of get over this loss? Um, what is it that might speed up um, acceptance of the loss? How long is the bereft prairie vole going to like press the lever to um, open the door for access to his you know, former lover and, and um, how soon can this prairie vole perhaps get interested in, in you know, partner number two. Um, one of the things she's discovered is that um, it's, it's possible there may be a medication that we can take to sort of speed up heartbreak recovery someday. I'm skeptical of this. Um, 
I think a lot of the psychotropic medications we take are sort of, um, you know, disappointing or they're only part of the journey. Um, but she's also looking at what happens if these prairie voles end up um, spending more time with their siblings or with other prairie voles. Can, can sort of being social help us get through the loneliness and grief and yearning of heartbreak? I had no idea all this research is being done. And I also, you did come up with the fact that vole is an anagram for love. I thought that was. <laughs> just They're sort of really see. cute. They're really cute. They look like hamsters and they sort of um, huddle together. And they're they're just like, these pictures of them on the internet just slay me. So be, you begin to look at your own trauma. You say, I may not have PTSD. It's been too, it's too recent, but I definitely have the T, uh, the, the trauma in um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, <clears throat> you hike with a group of women who have experienced profound trauma. Uh, they've been addicts, they've been abused. That sort starts to be a turning point for you. When you begin to learn from other people, and we do want to acknowledge that men also get dumped. They have a slightly different reaction. You may want to speak to that. Uh, but you, of course, being a woman, you were hiking with these women, you learned from them. I did. Um, this was an assignment from Outside Magazine to write about a group of women uh, who had been sex trafficked. And um, they had been through a year of residential treatment. Um, this sort of backpacking trip in Colorado was kind of a reward for them in some ways for, for sort of getting through this first year of treatment. Um, and also a way to kind of further their healing by being in nature. And I, I was so fascinated to spend time with them. Um, not because in any way I felt like I could compare, you know, my pain or trauma to theirs, but I, I was just really moved by, um, how resilient, um, they could be and how being together for them and learning how to sort of move their bodies, learning how to trust their bodies. Again, um, the movement piece was, it has been known to be really effective, um, for trauma treatment. Um, so it ended up for me being very inspirational that not just can trauma be contagious? You know, if you spend a lot of time, you know, if you're a first responder or something like that, but, but actually the resilience can be contagious. Uh, and, and so for me, it was a really powerful experience. Let's go back to Steve Cole. This is just around the time where you're going to give him uh, four milliliters, whatever it was of blood. What does he find and how often is he going to measure you? So time one, uh, my first blood draw UCLA was, I think about five or six months after the split. And, um, it took a while to analyze that blood, but but he later told me, yeah, that first blood draw, you had the blood of a lonely person. So my blood was, was putting out more transcription factors for inflammation. I was, yes. Did it make um, you feel even worse? Sorry. Did it make you feel even worse? Oh yeah. Um, well, he told me, so, so he told me that, um, actually at, at the same time that he told me about later blood draws. So I didn't get that news right away. Um, okay. and, and so he and I sort of designed this experiment where I was so invested in the idea that being in nature was going to help me and running in this big river in the wilderness was going to cure my heartbreak. So we decided to draw blood before the river trip and then draw blood after the river trip. Uh, and so when we looked at those two blood draws together, you know, I was kind of expecting, you know, this would be so great for the book, like, yay, the river trip healed me. Look how great my blood is at time two. And it was this big disappointment <laughs> because my blood actually looked the same after the river trip, pretty much as before the river trip. <laughs> but the river trip, which kind of comes on the heels of, of being outside with these women. And of course, we should say two things. You did have conventional therapy all through this. You didn't walk away from your own therapist. You had, of course, a divorce attorney. People need that in these kinds of situations or somebody to make arrangements. But you also had a lifelong experience as a paddler, as a canoeist and a kayaker, a hiker. And so for you to plan a 30 day river trip, uh, you know, I'd rather go with you than with me because you knew what you were doing. Um, that was really important to me as sort of a healing modality. And actually, I, I think my dad might be on the Zoom tonight. And um, hi, dad. I'm 
love you. And so grateful to you because my, my dad, when I was little would take me on these river trips every summer. Um, I grew up in New York city, but I spent summers in a canoe basically. Um, and, and then my, my ex-husband was also a river runner. Um, and we did these trips with our families and we did them together and we had sort of a wonderful, wonderful experiences doing these. Um, but I felt like it was important to reclaim this as, um, sort of a core part of who I was outside of the marriage, not just in the marriage. And, um, it, I think it makes sense that I kind of looked to a river also because I found the metaphors so irresistible. You know, I needed to learn how to paddle my own boat. I needed to get out of his boat and get in my own boat. And that's literally what I did on this river trip. So I paddled my own boat the whole way. Um, uh, half of this 30 day trip that I did was solo by myself. I needed to learn how to be alone. I had never been alone before. I needed to learn how to access bravery. Um, and I needed to sort of experience a transition from sort of the broken bad lands of my marriage to sort of a new land that would hopefully be, you know, sunny and, and manageable. So where I could be like the, the, the pilot, right. Of my own sort of future. So, so that storytelling piece was important. Um, and I would say, you know, the river trip was great in a lot of ways and I did access some bravery and I did learn how to be more comfortable being alone, but it didn't, it didn't change my immune cells. And that's probably because I was alone, you know, and being alone in the wilderness is not a state of calm and relaxation. It's actually a state of heightened alertness because you can't screw up out there. Right. And you, you, you didn't make that point. You hadn't really factored that in, but it is. Yeah, like somehow I, yeah. It is delightful to go with you because you are learning how to be alone, even if it doesn't change your blood markers. You have to jettison this heavy portable toilet, which was a ridiculous thing the outfitters gave you. You fry, literally fry your uh, a letter that you wrote to your ex. An, a nice letter. Um, the last word we see floating into the river is sweet when you when you dump it. And of course, the metaphors you talk about, you were uh, on the Green River. And the canyons and the places you went through, do you want to say them? They're so marvelous. Yeah, I mean, it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece of wilderness. One of, one of the largest roadless wildernesses in North America, um, a, a number of canyons that you go through. I needed, it, it was also required a lot of logistics. You know, I had to get the permits and I had to plan the food and I had to, you know, um, all of that actually was also helpful in some ways for healing from heartbreak, because it, it puts you into this kind of cognitive load um, of your brain and out of a limbic state. You know, there's another neuroscientist I talked to later who was like, yeah, expedition planning. It's, it is actually, it can be really good for your mental health. Um, so it's a, it's a special, special river. And it, the last two weeks I was in Can, Canyonlands National Park, um, which is a gorgeous stretch and, and not, not scary in terms of whitewater. Um, but very, very hot. I was there in the summer. It was 104 degrees. Um, you do feel, you do feel like you really, um, might get hurt and you need to try not to. So after what was a desolation Canyon disaster falls, split mountain, eventually, um, you, you, you don't capsize, you don't go with the torrent, you make it. Um, I was cheering for you. You do. That is when you think, OK, I've done just, you know, this is my odyssey. This is my quest. We can practically, you know, hear you slinging a chalice up into the sky. And that's when you find out that, no, it didn't change my blood markers. Only after the trip. Let down. I would be so let down. It was a lot. I mean, even without the blood markers, I knew that it hadn't cured my heartbreak because I was still really sad and I was still not really ready to let go of my marriage. I was not ready to arrive at some, you know, sunny destination that just didn't happen. Right. Um, so I, you know, I already knew before I got the blood work, I already knew, you know, <laughs> this isn't the sort of neat closure I was hoping Darn for. Green river. Damn it. <laughs> so um there's so much in this book we have to you know you you did everything you could think of to do electric shocks in a lab while looking at pictures of your ex 
uh, I mentioned this, uh, the, the, uh, the acupuncture with the Lorax trees of moss. What, what finally got your attention? What was the crossing the Rubicon, if you will, better living through chemistry? Eventually you think, I need to not be sad. I need to not feel so lonely. It's not about being brave, but not being sad. Jackie, I can't really point to sort of one thing as, as being necessarily the most helpful. Um, I tried so many things that had some scientific evidence behind them. Um, I tried EMDR therapy, you know, I, um, yes, yeah, sort of rapid eye movement supposed to be good for trauma. I tried the movement. I tried the nature. I tried the wilderness. I, um, I tried, um, psychedelic therapy. All of these things were helpful. Um, and I think over time with the addition of time, um, you know, eventually I, I, I got to a place where I felt so much better. Um, you know, the, the psychedelic therapy was actually surprisingly fantastic in terms of reducing my feelings of fear about the future, um, and helping me just feel like I could separate from my marriage, um, in an interesting way. Um, and then, you know, at the, at the end, um, I don't know at the end, but two years later from the split, we, we did the final blood work and, um, I'm happy to say that, that my immune system, <laughs> my transcription factors were looking much shinier finally um, <laughs> two years after, but, you know, I would still say Jackie, that there's with heartbreak and with emotional trauma, social pain of this magnitude there, there's, there just isn't really, again, there isn't really a neat sense of closure. Like you're always going to have pangs of sadness and regret and memories. Um, and that's okay. You know, I, I, I knew that eventually I needed to learn to become a person who didn't need the cognitive closure as much. Right. That for me, that was kind of the big revelation. It's like, at first I thought I needed closure and then I became a person who didn't need closure. Who could live with it. Who could live with it. Who had a new life. Um, it's, it's a, it's a remarkable journey. I'm glad to use the word journey because it, it truly is one. And I could keep asking you questions. I actually had a few more, but we're getting such good and hefty questions in our Q and a that I think um, we should, we should take a few because here's a question that, are you ready to, to do that, Florence? Sure. Here's a question that occurred to me as, as I was reading this. Oh, wait, I have to put on the Q&A. And I'm in the chat. And for some reason, I'm not exactly seeing the Q&A. Oh, because it's down here. All right. So this is from Frankie. And she says, how about losing a partner to death? Does the heartbreak and grief have the same impact on health and life expectancy and one's blood? Yeah, it looks like um, it, it can be really similar experience. Um, certainly with bereavement after the death of a partner, um, there's the same feeling, I think, of abandonment. There can be the same feeling of fear for the future. Um, you know, Joan Didion wrote about the death of her husband and the death of her daughter. And she writes that, um, you know, the fear that you feel is not so much the fear for what you've lost or the anxiety over what you've lost. It's the fear for what you still have to lose, which I thought was a beautiful way to put it. Um, and as with heartbreak, with that kind of bereavement, there are about 15% of people really have a very hard time getting over it. Um, they've experienced complicated grief or persistent grief disorder, um, such that it's, it's very difficult, um, you know, to function, um, and to, and to forget, um, I mean, you don't necessarily want to forget, you know, your partner, if you've really loved them and you've lost them, but, but, but it, it sort of tips into making it very hard to move forward. Uh, and that's something that, that the Prairie Vole woman is also really interested in studying. Well, I was interested in how much really any sort of profound loss that would strike at your identity would have aspects of what occurred to you, that state of uh, hypervigilance, heightened anxiety, 
some sort of fear of the unknown, the world changing so instantly. The loneliness um, that so many people are feeling now, especially with the pandemic. Um, there's so many lessons, I think, from heartbreak that that suddenly have felt very relevant. Here is a question from a scientist, David Grinspoon, and he's asking, why is love and the loss of it so closely identified with the heart as opposed to any other vital organ or physical manifestation? That's such a good question. Because you said heaps of art about heartbreak and so relatively little science. You know, I will say though, David, that there are a lot of organs that become involved uh, in, 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 um, manifesting grief and heartbreak. So my pancreas, you know, was, was much more badly beaten up, I think, than my heart, um, you know, as an organ. Um, but, but we do know that there is a kind of heart failure that can often occur in people who have suffered a severe emotional blow. And that is called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, and I, I spent time with a woman who had suffered this at the age of 41, um, after her boyfriend left her, got another woman pregnant. Um, and she felt her chest seizing up. I think, I think actually many of us probably can relate to that experience of, of feeling in our chest, you know, that kind of pain. Um, but in her case, uh, it was such that the stress hormones flood the heart, um, so, intensely that the left ventricle, one of the quadrants of the brain balloons out and is unable to pump efficiently. And so people go into the emergency room or into the hospital with this kind of heart failure. And it doesn't look like a conventional heart attack because there's no blockage. Um, the arteries are fine. It's just that the, the heart changes shape. So uh, heartbreak is real. Heartbreak is real. You know, also you have epigraphs here. You're, in this chapter, your cells are listening. A sad soul can kill you far quicker than a germ. That's John Steinbeck in Travels with Charlie. So, you know, obviously it's been around since time immemorial, uh, but this helps us process and understand. Someone else is asking here, not an anonymous person. I've been divorced twice, the first time initiated by my husband, and I experienced similar impacts to what you did, Florence. But the second time, I was the one who left, and I felt liberated, released, and happy. And did you have the chance to look into whether that person who left uh, experienced a different kind of biological reaction than the person who got dumped? Yeah, it's so unfair, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I, I did talk about this with Helen Fisher. I was like, what happens to the person who does the dumping? You know, does he just skate away? Is, is, is he just free as a bird? And often, as, as you expressed, I think sometimes that, that person feels great. You know, it can be really liberating, but not always. I mean, anytime you're breaking up a family, you're breaking up, you know, an intense relationship. Um, I think it also can be really painful. Like, there can be a lot of guilt. Um, there can be a lot of anxiety. Um, so, so I think it, it, you know, it can be really difficult for both, but as Helen pointed out to me, we just haven't studied the people who do the dumping as much as we've studied the people who are dumped. Yeah. Um, well, what, uh, what was your, someone else is asking, what was your ex's reaction to this book? You, you, I think you treat him quite well here and gently enough. Um, I, I gave him an early draft of the book. I didn't want him to be surprised by it. Um, I wanted him to have an opportunity to make some changes. And he, he did make, he did ask for some changes um, that I granted. And, um, you know, ultimately uh, he's a much more private person than I am. Uh, I'm used to talking about myself. And I, don't, I, I come from a family culture of sort of more disclosure, I think. Um, but ultimately, I mean, he's, he's been supportive. I think he understands, you know, why I needed to write this book. Um, we've sat down with our kids who are now both adults uh, and have told them, you know, about this book, Mom's Writing. And um, I, I, I have come around to really feeling very grateful for the time and the, the very good years that we've had together. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I think I always will feel, you know, some love and I'm sure he always will too. Um, and I, and, and now I have, you know, a lot of forgiveness as well. Yeah. <clears throat> it's an excellent place to come to. I'm sure many people would like to arrive at that place. Um, question here from Susan, could you please talk more about the power of storytelling and story writing? Um, 
that was a seeing in your divorce, the therapist recommending this recovery. She said that story dropping into the story of who I think I am helps me feel more free, less self-identified. You know, I thought about that a lot because not only do you have all these marvelous, even when they're to my brain, almost kooky <laughs> experiments, some of them, um, and some very good. You're also crafting narrative. You're also telling story. You're also weaving words. That's important. I you think the power of narrative is, is really important and science backs this up. So um, psychologists have been studying um, whether people are helped by describing their divorce experiences and other negative life events um, you know, in, in ways that create a sort of a beginning and a middle and an end um, that enable the, the, the person doing the narrating to feel like they are in charge of the story. Um, it's incredibly helpful and important. Um, from a literary perspective, it can be tricky because you don't necessarily want to write from the wound as much as you want to write from the scar. Um, you know, if you're too raw, um, that can be hard to read on the page. Um, so the act of writing itself can give you a little bit of distance um, and that, that can be helpful. But I also found that I had to go back and write some really painful scenes and sort of stay in the zone of heartbreak um, for a long time. So, you know, in some ways it was helpful and in some ways it was also really still painful. Did, you know, most of us probably won't have a, a, a book. Well, I, I shouldn't say <laughs> You know, many people will not be writing a book after a rupture. Uh, that may not be true of some of the folks we know. But the did you ever feel despairing, or did having the sense of well, I'm 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 an observer now. I have a task. My profession is to write about this. Um, let keep you from feeling too heavily like you were going to fall into despair. I I would say there were definitely some moments of despair. Yeah, sure. But it was helpful to have a purpose. It was helpful to have a project that sort of got me out of bed in the morning and got me into the field with my little recorder, talking to scientists who, by the way, were so lovely and told me about their heartbreaks, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, which was validating and also, um, I think, made, you know, made, made them into sort of human characters in the book. So that the act of reaching out itself and the act of connecting with other people right, is so important for getting out of despair. Someone is asking about, as someone who was, you know, pre-diabetic or, or very, you know, had uh, type one diabetes, were you apprehensive about things like the drug ecstasy and psilocybin? And maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that turned out to be a positive because it wasn't initially when you took that ecstasy you, which you did with a therapist you were frightened your face was burning yeah if you stopped it you would have um you know I, I i wasn't i wasn't that worried about the diabetes because my blood sugars have been really in control um i have a great endocrinologist and um you know sort of a, a, a i've just been managing it pretty well um i was more worried about the river trip because there I was going to be uh, in the middle of no place with no roads. Um, you know, if my blood sugars did get really high, I wasn't sure what to do about that. At, at that time, I, I managed to not have to take insulin with me. So I didn't have to worry about the insulin getting too hot, which is a big concern when, when you're in the desert. Um, I had a really, really restrictive diet. Uh, and I was monitoring my blood sugar pretty carefully. So, um, you know, fortunately, uh, that was okay. But you had two visual metaphors, one with the, um, is it MDMA? I might be mixing that up. And one with the psilocybin. Um, forgive me if I just did that. One with the ecstasy and the other with the mushrooms. Uh, and with the ecstasy, you imagined that you were a tree and your husband was embedded in the um, bark of the tree or the center, the, the cadmium. Sure. What is it called? The cambrium. Cambrium. And and you were going to grow up around him. I mean, it was a pretty lovely image. It was a trippy image, but it, it was, again, one of those metaphors that was actually really helpful to me. Um, and I was working with a therapist, when, by the way, I want to sort of qualify this, um, who really knew what she was doing. It was really helpful. 
Um, but I, I did, I envisioned my, my ex as a strangler fig, <laughs> you know, sort of around my trunk, you know, which he, he was, I mean, he was a part of me for so long and a part of me that I was very reluctant, you know, to, to let go of. And so, um, during this, this ex psychedelic experience, I was able to kind of envision unwinding him from my trunk so that I could then grow, you know, I mean, it was like, it, it was such a sort of obvious metaphor, but it was, for me, it was very powerful. And you had another image, which I was also just quite fascinated with, uh, with the mushrooms where you imagined people as molecules and you were all, <laughs> and I thought, well, this is perfect because this is what she's been doing. It's all molecules. Yeah, I love that. I, I, um, you know, they say when you when you're having a, a an experience like this, you lose your ego, like you lose your sense of self. And so I, I was envisioning that that we were all sort of beads in a bead curtain, and I couldn't tell which bead was me and which bead was you. And you know, we were all just beads. These beads were molecules. And then I was like, oh, and our emotions. Guess what? Those are just chemical signals. Our emotions are just molecules too. Like, why do we take them so seriously? Why do we take ourselves so seriously? Like, and it, and it was a very benign and sort of, you know, lighthearted kind of insight. It was like, maybe we don't need to take ourselves quite so seriously. It's really helpful. That can be pretty hard, of course, when you when it's fresh. So the time did have something. And one of the things you found is what we've always known. Tincture of time did work. The passage of time which of course you passed in exploration, still counted because it was still time passing. What we're told as kids, you'll feel better one day. This won't always hurt. True enough, right? True, true enough. One question that's come in several times here is, uh, and I think it's a good one, is what does forgiveness and acceptance look like to you? How would you say that you're a new, I don't know if new is the right word, that you're an enhanced Florence Williams now? Who what is the shiny new Florence? Um, who, yeah, who's the, the buffered one. <laughs> I've thought about that a lot. Um, and, and, and I think that this is the strongest thing I can say is I feel like I have learned so much about emotional intelligence. I have learned how to kind of inhabit my vulnerability in a way that I didn't before, you know, it's not something that we're taught how to do to sort of present ourselves as, as having big emotional needs or, or, or being volatile emotionally. Um, I had always just projected a lot of competence and um, kind of moved forward. And now I feel like I'm not so interested in projecting that anymore. Um, I've having experienced these, these lows, I've also experienced the highs and the joys of feeling like I'm a human being. Um, and I, I would like to be able to, um, encourage, you know, all of us and encourage us to raise our children to be comfortable with their emotions and to be able to express them um, so that maybe we can prevent some heartbreak in the future. If we can really learn how to meet each other sort of as authentic people, um, I really think we'll all be better off. That's a wonderful bequest for your children and a wonderful legacy from your marriage. And uh, things are good now, right? We're not gonna find things are good. Moving forward, good, good enough, as we all like to say. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful conversation and um, the questions are gonna keep coming in. You've got weeks and months and years ahead to answer some of them out there. And please everybody, order heartbreak. You will be glad that you did. Uh, Brad, thank you to Politics and Prose. Uh, Florence, thank you for writing this remarkable book. You really are a brave soul. Thank you, Jackie. Great You're part. You're a, a brilliant mind and a good friend, and really appreciate your being here. A great moderating, Jackie, as as usual, and, uh, and Florence. <laughs> what a, what an important and, and relatable book, you know. Jackie called your your journey remarkable. It's it's also so instructive. And as someone said, summing it up, you lost a marriage but found another way of being. Um, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Heartbreak. And yes, we do have signed copies, thanks to Florence, who doesn't live too far away from the store. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. <laughs>